Okay, Revelation. We're back into Revelation chapter 1. We said now that uh, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And you're going to see his imprint and his name in every chapter on every page, um, or at least his power behind that uh, name. Uh, we see now in the first chapter especially so many things. We've said that uh, Genesis opens up all the doctrines of the Bible and it blossoms out and then it all comes back together in the book of Revelation. And so we look at Revelation chapter, we've looked at Re the revelation of Jesus Christ that God gave to show his servants in verse 1 and that he signified it by his angel to the servant John. And so it's written to John who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all them that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this book or this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it. So remember last week we talked about that's the blessing. It's not just to read it, but to heed it. And so the warnings and the, um, the time is near. And so we see now that uh, our Lord is revealed in his deity, in his glory, uh, more than any other book. So this is, the, and we're going to look at that this morning, just in verses four through eight, all the multiple t uh, times that we see the deity, uh, or the deity means that Jesus Christ was God. Uh, the gospels reveal him as a humble savior. The book of Revelation reveals him as exalted king. Before we get into the prophecy, you must understand the prophet. Uh, first four chapters give us 18 titles of our Lord. First four chapters. And so we're going to look at some of those this morning, just in the first four, uh, just in the four or five verses we'll be looking at. So there's 18 titles of our Lord. Um, this is the greatest concentration of divine titles in all scripture. Uh, Revelation 1, 4 through 8 gives us six of these titles. So we're going to look at a third of them uh, this morning. And so <clears throat> now we see uh, John says, John to the seven churches. So this was written to seven churches that then existed. And as a result, uh, we see that these are churches that are, that um, God says, uh, let us heed what the Lord says to the churches. And so we, when we get into that, we want to look and examine ourselves and our church in the light of God's word and in, in light of his blessings and warnings that he brings out in these seven churches because we are you know, the things that are. Uh, the things that, remember the uh, verse, chapter 19, the things which you have seen, that's chapter one. Uh, chapter two is the thing, and three, which are the seven churches, the, the things which uh, are. And then um, we'll see in verse four, after these things in chapter four, we see after these things, so the things that are to come. So that's the outline of the book of Revelation. And so we want to look, if this is the revelation of Jesus Christ, then uh, we want to make sure that uh, we realize that it's just that Jesus Christ wasn't just a prophet, as some people say. He was a prophet, priest, and king. Now, all through the scripture, you have uh, people that were prophets and priests, um, Samuel, Isaiah, um, you had some that were kings and prophets, uh, David uh, and uh, Hezekiah, but uh, you, uh, you didn't have any priests and kings because those are two different uh, um, setups except for Melchizedek. But, um, but um, we see that uh, uh, nobody fit the, the bill for prophet, priest, and king in the old te or uh, in the Bible until now, and we see that Jesus Christ is represented, or He is the prophet. He's the one who tells us the things that are to come. Um, he is uh, our priest. He ever makes intercession for us, and He, of course, He is presented as the King here. So we see that John uh, to the seven churches, grace to you and peace from Him who is and who was and who is to come from the seven spirits who are before its throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler over the kings of the earth to him 
who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests um, to uh, to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Uh, behold, he is coming in the clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him, even so. Uh, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Now, we looked at a little bit of that last week, but we see now that it's addressed to the seven individual churches that are in present-day Turkey. Um, Ephesus was the main church, and many people believe that um, that uh, the uh, several of the other churches, if not all of them, were kind of offsprings of the church of Ephesus. In other words, they were church planted. They were planted by people from Ephesus. From Ephesus, and so we see that they had their various problems. <coughs> he says, "Grace is our possession through Jesus Christ, and peace is what will be uh, taken from the world." In verse in chapter six, verse one, or verse four, we notice that he says, "Grace and peace to the churches." But when the churches are removed, in chapter four, he says, uh, "Come and see." Another horse that is red went out and it granted to, to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth. So peace will, peace will be taken from the earth during that seven-year period after the rapture, after the Lord comes for his church. So um, we see that uh, uh, we have peace, peace on earth today. When Jesus Christ came today uh, or he came uh, the first time to offer peace to the world. And those who have accepted him know a little bit about that peace. Uh, Peace like a river that attendeth my way when sorrows like like, um, sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well with my soul. That's the peace of the Holy Spirit. Peace with God. And as a result of the peace with God, we have peace, the peace of God in our lives. And so we see that... uh, uh, that this is what he wishes for the church. When peace is taken away from you and you're all in a turmoil, there's either something God is wanting you to do or God is telling you something that you shouldn't be doing. You know, think about it. Uh, why should I not have peace with the Lord? After all, uh, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. And so now do we all have turmoil? Yes. Did I have turmoil this week? Yes. Do I have turmoil right now this morning? My computer isn't working. I'm still wondering about my uh, my notes. Rob's are working on my notes because I didn't have my printer hooked up at home, and I just thought that Anna had them, and so uh, boy, I got I don't know. Every time I even send them, I even anyway, I won't get into all that. But uh, it's very frustrating, and yet uh, in it all, God knows what He's doing, and He works on that computer. Um, and it's his in any way. So we see that um, the peace of God, uh, in spite of all the problems that we can have. Now, notice his titles. First of all, we see uh, there's four titles, or six titles here. Him which is, which was, and which is to come. Now, that's the eternal, the which is. That's the eternal present one. Now, that's third person for I am. I am, he is. So, that is without faith, it is impossible to please him. But they that come unto God must believe that he is, that he is. He is what? He is, he is the I am. I am that I am. And so you must believe in the eternal present one. Without that faith, then, uh, then there's no salvation. So it, it was uh, he, that he is, um, God is, uh, he was, he's eternity past. He doesn't have a beginning or an end. Uh, he's eternal. That's one of the things that uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 3 tells us. Uh, he says, the Lord has set the world in our hearts that we can't know the end from the beginning, let alone eternity past and eternity future. Uh, infinity is always mysterious to us. Um, I remember as a child, not as a child, I guess a teenager, there was a very popular uh, television show that came on um, 
called Ben Casey. It was a doctor show. And uh, I remember junior hires, we had, you know, they had those shirts with the little buttons or the uh, snaps on them. And you would, uh, Ben Casey always wore it with a couple of, of uh, buttons unsnapped. Well, that became the fad. And everybody had one of those little shirts or those shirts that the pullovers with a little thing on the shoulder. And if you weren't, you just weren't cool as a seventh or eighth grader at Lakeview High School in Winter Garden, Florida. But uh, uh, I remember he would start off, or Sam Jaffe, who was one of the uh, actors, would start off, man, and he would draw the picture, you know, the circle with a, with a plus under it, and woman, and then birth would be the plus, and death would be the plus with the X through it, and then man, woman, birth, death, and then he would go infinity. And it was always that mysterious, and they were always dealing with somebody who was going to die, you know. And uh, Ben Casey was always, you know, always in a frustration. Um, the one I remember is uh, a guy told him, uh, you know, he said, Ben Casey said, you're going to live. And he said, uh, if I don't live, I'm going to send you 12 dozen, lo uh, um, um, 12 dozen roses, and I'm going to bill it to you. And the guy died, and in the show, Ben Casey got 12 dozen roses billed to him. You know, so one of those, one of those things where it's always, death is always a sting. Think, well, praise the Lord. Our guru came up with my message for this morning, and uh, we had, we'll make sure we get them into bulletin too. But it's nothing like having a lot of technical stuff on your notes and, uh, and realizing you don't have them. But uh, uh, I got to get my printer hooked up at home. But <clears throat> I got a brand new printer. But um, so we see infinity. I mean, he, who was? I mean, he was before. Now, why does he say he was? Because he was before time. Remember what we said last week? In the beginning. What's the beginning? Okay, please, let's go ahead and get that. Okay, in the beginning. Now, what, when did the beginning start? The beginning of time. In the beginning of time. Let's go ahead and get, get those out. Okay, thank you. Um, and so in the beginning of time, and then the end of time, the end of time as we know it, of course, is going to come uh, really after the thousand-year reign of the Lord because he does say there's going to be a thousand-year reign, and then he's going to set up a whole new heaven and a whole new earth. There won't be any day or, or there won't be any night there. The light from the, the Lord is going to shine through the universe. I don't understand it at all. Uh, there will be no more death. There will be just all those no, uh, no mores that you see in Revelation 21 and 22. No more, uh, you know, no more tears. Uh, I don't understand all that because of the ups and downs in life. I shed some tears or I know some people that have done you shed tears with them either proverbially because you're empathizing with them or um, a funeral this past week. You know, So there's, al there's always something in the ministry. The great heights, and so I've learned in the ministry, as soon as, man, you're really soaring high, something's going to hit you and knock, uh, knock it down a little bit. There's going to be somebody that gets hurt. You're going to get a telephone call. Here, Chris was really growing uh, greatly and... Uh, um, and I was really pleased with the hunger that he had for the Lord. And now he's in the hospital, you know, with kidney problems. He's only in his 40s, you know, and he called me this morning. Well, Lord, wait a minute. I was, that interrupts my discipleship program with him, you know, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so there's always some problem. But uh, I don't understand eternity future. I don't understand how that I can have a beginning but no end. Think about it. You're going to live forever somewhere. And man is all, the God has placed that in man's heart. Uh, there's never been a civilization unearthed by the archaeologists that did not have something to deal with eternity. I mean, they had some type of God or whatever. There's never been one. The, and even the atheist, if they, you know, I don't really think a person can be an atheist. They, they can be it uh, mentally to a point. And so, uh, but overall, there's a yearning, and that's one reason that they get so mad. And most, most atheists, avowed atheists, are very angry people because I think the, they're, they're fighting the Lord. 
Madeline Murray O'Hare, who took the Bible out of school, she was one of the major activists back then that uh, we blame her, but there was a lot more than that. But uh, if you ever heard her speak, she was one of the most foul-mouthed uh, women, mean, uh, just uh, whenever anybody would call her. I remember somebody, she kept saying, you have diarrhea of the mouth. I mean, she just would not let people talk. Uh, and just was, and her son uh, vouched for that later on as he got saved. And uh, he said, my, my mother was a very troubled woman. Now, of course, there's a lot of them that would pretend or they are wealthy or very, they got high positions in colleges or whatever else. But look at the, some of the dingbat stuff that some of these colleges are turning out. I mean, about, uh, and I think it's really an attack on God. Male and female, there's no more male and female. Why? Because God said there's male and female. So we got to attack that. There's always an attack, attack, attack. We got to attack the churches. We got to attack families. There's a, a government bureaucrat. Did you see that one bureaucrat today that uh, transgender, he's got, uh, he's got, he, it's a she or he, it's a he, but it's a she. And he's got lipstick and anyway, and he, he he's into all kinds of, Mass, I mean, horribly bestiology and all kinds of stuff. But he's ahead of some of our nuclear arsenal. Yeah, you know, it's scary, some of the things that we're having today. Um, and it's, it's an open defiance of God. If there is no God, I'm going to prove there is no God. And I'm going to go against anything that, you know, that God created. And so we see that. So the whole idea of uh, I am He's eternal present. Uh, what will he be to me uh, 10,000 years from now? He'll still, be, he'll still be the I am. Now, he was before I ever got here. He was before the world ever was formed. He will be after the world is over with. So that's the idea of that title there. Um, Hebrews uh, 11, 3, we've already quoted that, uh, but it was, uh, he that cometh God, unto God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Uh, in um, John eight fifty eight, 58, uh, the Lord said to those around him, he said, uh, before Abraham was, I was. Is that what he said? No. Before Abraham was, I am. So he's the eternal present one. Um, and so um, I am is a verb indicating not becoming, um, but it is a verb of, well, a linear verb. In other words, it's one of those that, uh, um, uh, it's a being verb, which means it's being. <laughs> it's, it's not, it doesn't have a beginning or an end. And so uh, he is the great I am. Now, notice also in verse 5, he's the faithful witness. Now, in Isaiah 55, 4, behold, I have given him for a witness to the people, a leader and a commander to the people. And so we know that Isaiah 55, those great uh, uh, messianic uh, passages from uh, chapter 40 through, verse, uh, through chapter 66, especially chapter 53 through 50, uh, 55, uh, we see that he talks about, uh, I have given him for a witness to the people. Now, Pilate, remember, he said, uh, Art thou a king then? And Jesus answered, Thou sayest I am a king. To this end I was born, or for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Now, he said that to Pilate. What did he say to his disciples just a few hours before? I am the way, the truth. Truth is reality. Without truth, there is no reality. And that's why if there's a rejection of truth, that's the reason you have all this perversion coming out of these uh, supposedly intelligent places. Uh, people are believing a lie. They are all twisted. The, the, the word iniquity, of course, we have stressed that many times is a word meaning twisted or twisted thinking. That's your inner being. From far from within, out of the heart of man, proceed evil thoughts. Transgressions are your actions. But uh, the iniquity, a man's messed up thinking. And so we see that uh, he was the truth. He's the one. The only way that we can know truth is to know him. 
Uh, the fear of the Lord is what? The beginning of knowledge. The, and knowledge is truth. I mean, either it's true or it's not. And so, again, we see that he is the faithful witness. Now, and of course, we're talking about our Lord. Um, he's the first begotten of the dead. Now, that's, uh, you know, that sounds kind of strange. But uh, he was, now, no, notice, remember uh, John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The idea was that uh, he allowed him to be born and that there's no better, you know, the Lord Jesus did not need to be born. He was already here. And there again, there's the mysterious. How did the eternal son of God come and dwell in the womb of a mother and be born? You know, the Bible tells us that uh, he emptied himself of all, you know, he, he, became, he took on the form of a servant. That is one of the most, the incarnation is one of the most interesting and intriguing studies in all the Bible. Uh, how did he do it? Uh, and why did he, of course we know why he did it, but uh, can you imagine Mary? Uh, and, you know, no, she kept all these things and pondered in her, in her heart. You can imagine what she had to ponder, ponder in her heart. I'm going to have a perfect child. I'm going to have the God child. Can you imagine what it must have been like to raise a perfect kid and you're a sinful mother? Uh, how would you like to do that, Anna? Of course, you've got a perfect daughter, but <laughs> no, but uh, no, um, but that would be, uh, and then, then again, here are you raising other kids with him and uh, as a mother, um, you know, why don't you be like Jesus? You know, no wonder that his brothers didn't like him for a while or whatever, you know, so. Uh, but then, you know, people hate good kids. You wonder what, what he had, if he got any fights at school or how did he overcome all that? Uh, those are just, when you really think about the Lord's incarnation, he just staggers the imagination. He just, and then he knew what, that he was coming. Someone said, I saw this quote this past week, um, talking about uh, abortion. Um, the first person on earth to recognize Jesus had come to earth was also in the womb. Who was that? John the Baptist. You know, I mean, that's just phenomenal. And how can you um, dissect the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ? And so he was, um, uh, he's, he is the head of the body, the church, which is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him all fullness should dwell. That's Colossians 1, 17 through 18. All fullness. We know that in, it, in him all things consist. Without the Lord Jesus, this whole world would fly apart. He knows every atom of your body. In every molecule, he knows everything about you. Uh, that is, you know, that's what, you know, phenomenal. The power that he has in the universe, he is in total control. And yet, and there again, that's one of those mysteries. If he's in total control, how can he give us a, a will? But if we don't have a will, you know, love is an emotion, but it comes from an act of the will. Really. Now, love can be an emotion and an infatuation. I mean, you might fall head over heels with somebody, but if you truly love them, there will be that work, that labor of love in their heart, in your heart for them. You'll want to please them. You'll want to meet their needs. Oh, I love you. Well, you, know, you love what you can get out of them. Uh, I've had, you know, I talk to men a lot of times and they're, you know, they're often skid row or whatever. Well, I love my family and I love my kids. I said, okay, now if you love them, you're going to show them your love. It's, you could talk, no, really, you need their love more than they need you right now. Just think about it. I mean, you, you, you talk about uh, leaning on the bottle. You're leaning on their love and you're just hoping they're going to love you. No, if, it's a labor of love. If you love them, you're going to do your best to do something for them. 
And isn't that true? I mean, that is true with the husband-wife relationship. Um, I won't talk too much about it, but I, you know, no. This past, uh, since the seven weeks ago or so, well, seven weeks and four days, five days ago, she had surgery. First first Sunday in, uh, the, the, this is se- six weeks. Okay, this is the seventh Sunday, and she's finally back in church. Well, I've been putting on her stockings, and I've been helping her up getting up out of bed and all kinds of other things. And uh, like I said, if I had $5 for every time she said, Dan, I'd have a, I could buy me a Lamborghini right now. But, uh, you know, but there again, hey, I told her I was going to love her. And, uh, and, and it's really, since I do love her, it's, it's not bad. I mean, I don't mind it. I mean, not, well, she knows I mind it. But you know what I mean is you go ahead and do it. It's like changing a baby's diaper. You love the little critter, but man, it does he stink, you know. <laughs> You know, and so there again, you do what you got to do for those that you love. And so again, um, you know, and actually, there's no love in the world without God because God is love. And I think that's going to be one of the worst part about hell is that if God is hell, excuse me, God is love, and there and God's not going to be there as far as then how much of that emotion can a person have? Well, I'll just get together with all my buddies. We'll have a big old party. Well, you might hate them. You know, hell is going to be a bad place because of, and I think that part of hell is going to be worse than the fire, the misery of not having God with you. You know, death, um, there's two forms of death in the Bible. Of course, there's separation from the body but then there's a separation from God and all the benefits that God gives. So that we see that, um, he, that he does have preeminence. Also notice he's the prince of the kings of the earth. The idea of a prince, uh, when he says that, is he's the, he's the leader. He's, he's over them all. He's the executive officer. Um, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And of course, we know he is the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Psalm 24, 1. He is the king of heaven, Daniel 4, 37. He's the king of the Jews, Matthew 2, 2. He is king of Israel, John 1, 49. He's the king of the ages, 1 Timothy 1, 17. He's the king of glory, uh, Psalm 24, 7. Uh, he's the king of the saints, uh, Revelation 15, 3. He's the king of kings, He's, uh, that's Revelation 19, verse 16. He's the prince of the kings of the earth. There again, that's the quote from Daniel 8, 23. So notice how all these things are coming together again uh, in the book of Revelation. In just uh, five verses, we have all these all these um, accolades, and that's just a third of them. That will be uh, within these first few chapters. And so we see that he is the prince of the kings of the earth, Notice now another term that, uh, that we're familiar with, but it carries a lot more meaning, and sometimes we need to get deep into it. And that is, and he says this three different times in these first chapters, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Now there again, he's eternity past. He, he was, he is, eternity present and eternity future. But also, he is the beginning. What does he mean by that? He's the creator. He's the one who made it happen. Uh, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Uh, Roman, uh, John chapter 1, who talked, uh, which presents, Je- or, or the book of John, represents Jesus Christ as God, begins with what? In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were created by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In other words, God made it all. But then he tells us, defines the word in chapter in verse 14 of chapter 1. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory full of grace and truth. And so we see now that, um, that he is the alpha. I mean, he... He's the beginning of the earth. He's the, and he, he will be the one. He was the one that was there at creation. And he will be, of course, there at the end of the millennium. 
So from beginning to time to the end of time, he will be there. And he, will, and he was there in eternity past before time and eternity future after time. I, there again, I, the Lord has set the eternity, or he has set uh, the world in my heart. I cannot, I cannot totally understand infinity and neither can you. Um, and so uh, <clears throat> we see, and that's one of the problems that you have with evolution. Well, um, oh, we know that uh, you know, there was, uh, there was you know, matter, and matter is eternal. Why does matter have to be eternal to the physicist? Because if it wasn't there, then somebody had to create it. And so wait a minute, it's always been there. Well, then how, how do you know, how are you absolutely sure it's always been there? God says he made everything. He created matter. He made the world out of nothing. And so again, we see uh, he is the alpha and the omega. Notice uh, he, uh, for him, by him, all things were created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or power, all things were created by him and for him and he was before all things, and by him all things consist or exist. So there, there again, Colossians was written to uh, agnostics, those who said, oh, we're not sure there's a God or not. Well, Paul is saying, yes, and Jesus Christ is the creator, and before and through him all things exist. And so um, Colossians is a philosophical book. It uh, deals a lot with... Uh, uh, with the philosophies of of that age. And so we see that he says that, and, and Colossians is a, a book on creation. It was through Jesus Christ that all things consist and all things hang together. Um, and so Ecclesiastes, I've quoted this several times, Ecclesiastes 3.11, where he says that um, they set, he set the world in our, he set creation in our heart because we can't know the end from the beginning. So we see those, uh, so he is not only the, um, we see that he is the, his titles, which are the eternal God, I am that I am. He's a faithful witness. He's the first, first begotten of the dead. He is uh, prince of the kings of the earth. He's the alpha and the omega. And then that great term, El Shaddai, the almighty. That's who, Jesus, that's who God was in the, so he revealed himself in the Old Testament. The all-sufficient one, that's what El Shaddai means. Uh, El is God, or Elohim, and Shaddai is all-sufficient, or the sufficient one. Uh, beginning with Abraham, 17, uh, verse 17 through, uh, in chapter 17, verse 1 and 2, he revealed himself to Abraham as El Shaddai. And that's one thing that God does in the Bible. He reveals himself through his names and the definitions of those names. And so uh, we see that uh, he is the all-sufficient one. He's, in other words, what is he? He's everything I need. My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. Uh, so again, he is the all-sufficient one. He's everything I need for salvation. I can't do a thing for myself. He's everything I need in life. He's my all in all, as we say. And so um, he's El Shaddai, uh, beginning with Abraham. He introduced that to him. Abraham, Lord, uh, I need a son. If you tell me you're going to have all this, then how am I going to have a, um, how am I going to do this? Um, don't worry about it, Abraham. I got it planned out. Did he? <laughs> yes, he did. And so, uh, so he said that he reveals himself through his name, in the Old Testament, uh, 40, uh, 48 times in the Old Testament, there's different definitions or reveals different names or different de uh, or renditions or, or uh, variations of his name. And they all have something to do with his character, with his being, with his attributes. And so we see that uh, 48 times, different times, the way that he's named in the Old Testament. The all-sufficient God is none other than our Lord Jesus Christ. Here he is called, after all the rest of those names, the first six, now he says, I'm the God of the Old Testament too. Now, of course, he had already alluded to that, but now he's definite. So anyone who says that, you know, the, the Bible never says that Jesus Christ is God. Well, 
what do you do with this passage? You know, and, and what do you do with before Abraham was, I am? I mean, over and over again, the Lord, uh, he didn't come out as we, as Americans would like him to say, I am God. Well, Shirley MacLaine did that a few years ago. Uh, she, is, she stood uh, on the, uh, at the seashore and her testimony was she looked out at the sea and she said, she raised her hands and said, I am God. Aren't you glad that God has a sense of humor? I mean, he didn't strike her with a wave or anything like that. Um, I mean, you can call yourself God all you want to. But uh, we'll talk about one who did this morning uh, with uh, Herod. But um, so he's the almighty one. He's the sufficient. He can save us from our sins. And he, and also he can hear our prayer. And so <clears throat> I notice he says uh, that, uh, uh, and he made us kings and priests uh, and to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. And so he has made us kings and priests. Why can we be kings and priests? Because we're children of the king. And so I don't understand that one totally because I certainly don't feel like a king. But uh, and, I, and I can be a priest as you can too as you go boldly before the throne of grace and pray for Anna that she'll sell three more cars before Christmas. That's priestly prayer, isn't it? Or that you pray for my wife that she doesn't use that cane to beat on her mean husband or whatever. You know, no, she won't, but you know. Uh, you know, just, uh, of course, praying, and I appreciate your prayers for her. She's doing quite well now, and I'm very pleased that she didn't even use a walker to get to church this morning. But uh, that answers the prayer, and God meets our needs, doesn't he? And so there, boy, isn't this exciting? And just the first three, of just the richness of who God is. He's everything that we need. And isn't it interesting, before he gets into all the chaos and the turmoil uh, in the coming chapters, he begins with who he is. And he says, I'm in control. I know what's gonna I know when it's gonna begin, I know when it's gonna end. And he knew when he knew before the foundations of the world, Della, when you were gonna be born. You know, he knew where you're gonna be born, he knew all kinds of things about you before you were ever even thought of by other people. You were not a mistake by the lake, you know, or whatever, you know. We say that in, you know, in Detroit, beside the lake, you know. <laughs> no, you are not a mistake. God knew when you were going to be here. And so if he knew, then I can, I know who holds the future, and I know who holds my hand. Isn't that a blessing? Okay, let's pray. Father, now we do thank you for your goodness to us. Lord, we thank you that we can call you our Father because of what your son Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. And even as we pray to you, we don't even know how to pray to you as you ought. You're the three in one. And we know all three of you are listening. And yet, Lord, uh, we thank you that uh, you saved us. And we thank you that we can call upon you. We thank you that the Holy Spirit is working in our hearts today. And we pray, Lord, now that that power and the power that Paul prayed for the church of Ephesus that we would know that exceeding greatness of your power, Lord, that you can work through us and touch other people's lives. Lord, we're not praying for riches on this earth. On this earth they're going to be burned up. But we are looking for eternal riches, better far than gold. Lord, people that are saved, our, our brothers, our sisters, our children, our grandchildren, that they will know you as their Savior. Bless Belvedere through this church, Lord. Bring people, many, many people to yourself through the spoken word and the written word of God. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen.